All right. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, so I just have a few things at the top, and then I'd be happy to go in and take your questions. So just at the top today, today the department is announcing approximately $400 million in additional security assistance for Ukraine under the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, or USAI. The USAI package underscores the continued U.S. commitment to supporting Ukraine by meeting their most urgent requirements, while also providing, while also building the capacity of Ukraine's armed forces to defend its sovereignty over the long term. This announcement, this announcement represents the beginning of a contracting process to provide additional priority capabilities to Ukraine. Some of the capabilities include funding to refurbish Hawk air defense missiles for inclusion in future presidential drawdown packages, 45 refurbished T-72 tanks with advanced optics, communications, and armor packages, 1,100 Phoenix Ghost tactical unmanned aerial systems, 40 armored riverine boats, funding to refurbish 250 M-111 777 armored security vehicles provided um, via the ex excess defense articles, tactical secure communication systems and, and surveillance systems, and funding for maintenance and sustainment. Of note, on the overhauled T-72 tanks included in this package, they are part of a trilateral coordinated effort with the Netherlands and the Czech Republic. Um, the USAI release and trilateral statement um, should be available on defense.gov and sh hopefully shortly hitting your inboxes. So in total, the United States has now committed more than $18.9 billion in security assistance to Ukraine since the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration. Since 2014, the U.S. has committed more than $21 billion in security assistance and more than $18.2 billion since the beginning of Russia's unprovoked and brutal invasion on February 24th. One last um, note. Finally, as mentioned on Tuesday from the podium, Secretary Austin welcomed home members of the 18th Airborne Corps who deployed to Germany in February 2022 to assure our NATO allies and to deter Russian aggression. Following Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, their mission swiftly evolved to support the execution of historic levels of security assistance provided by the United States and our partners and allies around the world to support Ukraine's defense. The United States remains committed to supporting Ukraine's near-term needs on the battlefield and its long-term requirements to deter and defend against future Russian ag aggression. To maintain the historic level of our ongoing security su assistance support for Ukraine, I'm pleased to announce today that the department will establish the Security Assistance Group Ukraine, what we will call SAGU, which is a dedicated headquarters element in Wiesbaden, Germany, and under U.S. European Command to coordinate our efforts. This headquarters will be similarly scaled in scope to our current footprint, but it will ensure we are postured to continue supporting Ukraine over the long term. And with that, I will take your questions. We will turn to the phones first. Uh, Tara Kopp, AP. Hey, thanks for doing this. Um, on the USAI, you said about 400 million. Do you have an exact figure of what this USAI number is? I would say approximately $400 million. I don't have the exact specific number. Okay. So these will all be for contracts for like for the Phoenix Ghost, how long would it be that you anticipate before the, those systems would get to Ukraine? So um, on the Phoenix Ghost, as you know, in um, previous USAI packages that we announced, um, I believe in June we had announced um, uh, 580 Phoenix Ghosts um, that we committed to Ukraine. A portion of these have already been delivered to Ukraine, and we've seen success already on the battlefield, but I don't have an exact timeline for when this next um, tranche will be delivered. Okay, great. I will take it over to the room. Yes, go ahead. Um, just wanted to follow up on the, on the T-72s. Um, is yeah. this the, I believe this is the first provision of tanks as part of security assistance to Ukraine. Is that correct? From the United States, it is the first um, provision of tanks. And these, uh, but just to clarify and make sure that um, it's understood, these tanks are coming from the Czech Republic defense industry, and the United States is paying for uh, 45 of those to be refurbished, and the government of the Netherlands is matching our commitment and will provide an additional 45 tanks. So we're looking at a total of 90 tanks going into Ukraine. Um, and as you mentioned, these will be the most technically advanced tanks on the battlefield. 
Great. I guess mm -hmm. I got another Ukraine question. Sure. Um, so Russia said today that more than 5,000 civilians are being removed from Kherson on a daily basis. How, how does the U.S. view that? Is this a voluntary process, or is it, does it amount to deportation? So we've seen the open source reporting there. Um, I can't independently verify uh, exactly m more on those evacuations. We're seeing Ukraine um, continue to uh, advance on its counteroffensive. We're seeing Russia shore up its defensive lines around Kherson. But um, I, I just have nothing further to add on those on those reports. Can take, yeah, Laura, and then I'll come back to you. Or... Just, just to clarify, um, mm -hmm. the tanks again. I'm sure. sorry if I misunderstood you. Um, yeah. So it's, can you say how many tanks we are sending, and how are, how many of them are U.S. tanks, and how many of them are are Czech or other foreign sure. countries' Czech tanks? So none of these are U.S. tanks. They're coming from the Czech Republic defense base. So we are paying for 45 of these to be refurbished. And the government of the Netherlands is paying for an additional 45 to be refurbished, so they're matching our commitment. So a total of 90 tanks will be um, delivered to Ukraine. And um, just to footstomp that a little bit, the, this agreement between um, the Czech Republic and the Netherlands is a direct outcome um, of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. Um, and so this is just one of uh, a deliverable that came from, from the meeting that was earlier this year. So, uh -huh. so the USAI money is going to the Czech defense base? To the refurbishment of these tanks, which are owned by the Czech Republic, yes. Okay, and then the Czechs will send them. So how long will it take for those tanks to actually get to Ukraine? Um, just a minute here. Uh, I believe we are anticipating a... Um, so the contracting actions uh, are going to begin soon, and then some of the tanks will be available to Ukraine before the end of December, so the end of this year, um, with additional deliveries to be completed in 2023. Okay. Great. And then, sorry, mm -hmm. if I could just, just follow up on the security yeah. assistance group sure. in Ukraine that you announced. Is that an evolution of the defense contact group, or is it a separate thing? Separate. So the the security assistance group, so the SAGU, it's not a new mission. Um, this is a more effective and streamlined way to um, manage the process. And this is a continuation of building on the work that the 18th Airborne Corps already had, had done in, in, um, in the region. Um, and so this just, the SAGU is a logical way to continue to provide short-term assistance, but also long-term assistance to Ukraine. And as you saw, the president spoke to this in Madrid, that um, we remain committed to, to Ukraine um, uh, for as long as it takes. The SAGU is going to help with those long-term efforts. Great. I'll go to Barbara in the back. Sabrina, um, on your own public website, you posted remarks uh, from Admiral Charles Richard, head of U.S. Strategic Command, and he said in the remarks uh, just yesterday, uh, as I assess our level of deterrence against China, the ship is slowly sinking. It's sinking slowly, but it is sinking, as fundamentally they're putting capability in the field faster than we are. Those curves keep going. It isn't going to matter how good our operating plan is or how good our commanders are or how good our horses are. We're not going to have enough of them, and that is a very near-term problem. So he oversees much of America's nuclear force, and he's put in a time frame and specifics on this just days after you released your military strategy and your nuclear posture review, a very near-term problem. You don't have enough commanders. You don't have enough weapons. I don't know what he really means about you not having enough horses. but. Is this not, do you have concerns that this is an operational security problem that he has now been so specific uh, about um, the, the, um, the lack of American capability, nuclear capability against the Chinese, and that he's put a time frame on it, very near-term problem? So I think we, I, I think we feel very confident in our capabilities uh, when it comes to uh, China or just generally in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the secretary laid out in his national defense strategy that China remains our uh, pacing challenge. Uh, we know that um, in order to compete with China, we are we are doing more when it comes to our own readiness and our. Um, 
own uh, on, on our own exercises. But I think um, I think we we definitely are um, monitoring things that are happening in the Indo-Pacific and remain ready um, to act if needed. So you have no concerns about what he publicly said that we have a very near-term problem. I would refer you to Admiral Richards for for, for more on that. Can I ask you also very mm -hmm. briefly, last Friday there was not an insignificant security breach at the Pentagon, which was never publicly revealed, a suspect uh, in a high-speed vehicle yeah. uh, made it a good distance around the perimeter of the Pentagon before law enforcement could stop this suspect. Uh, not, uh, I think everyone believes that the law enforcement officers absolutely did the best they could, so it's not about them. But why was the Pentagon workforce not told that there had been such a significant intrusion in perimeter security that somebody made it a very significant distance around the building through two security barriers. The public statement that came from uh, PIFPA management only said that they stopped the person quickly, never acknowledged that this suspect made it past two perimeter security points, and are you reviewing perimeter security? Uh, so thank you for the question. Um, just in terms of uh, answering the question, I, you know, first I'd say that we are incredibly grateful for PIFPA uh, police officers for everything that they did um, to apprehend the driver and um, keep this building secure. Um, we don't, uh, we do not announce security threats to the Pentagon nor comment on law enforcement issues, um, especially when there are ongoing investigations or pending legal action. Um, the only exception to that is if there is an immediate safety issue, and there was not at the time. Uh, that was not assessed. So. Um, Secretary Austin, um, our leadership here has full confidence um, in our PIFPA police, in our Pentagon uh, force protection, and um, we thank them for, for what they did last week. I'm going to take it. Yeah, Rio. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, just one quick question for sure. North Korea. Yeah. Uh, how much is the Pentagon seriously concerned that the recent North Korea's provocations could lead to miscalculation and unintended military conflict on the Korean Peninsula? Well, I think you were here yesterday. You saw the secretary and his ROC counterpart speak to this. Um, you know, these the actions that North Korea has taken with uh, uh, missile launches continue to destabilize the region. Um, but I would say further commit ourselves and um, uh, further, uh, I would say, build our alliance when it comes to South Korea and Japan. Um, as you know, we're conducting Vigilant Storm now. That exercise was extended for another day um, in order to shore up um, not only our alliance, but to show that um, our strength and, and, you know, that we can deter aggression when, when needed. I'm going to go to the phones and then I'll come back into the room. Um, here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, Jeff Shogel. Thank you. I understand if these questions have to be taken. But can you say which variant of T-72s uh, the U.S. is paying for, whether they have any type of active uh, denial system? And I believe they have a 125-millimeter gun. Where is the ammunition coming from, considering DOD has often said that post-Soviet stockpiles and new uh, NATO members are exhausted? So, thanks, Jeff, for the question. Um, in terms of where the ammunition is coming from, you know, when I have more details or anything more to announce, I'd be happy to get back to you on that. I don't have more specifics on the tanks themselves. Uh, they're, they're the T-72 tanks. Um, they are sourced from the Czech Republic defense industry. Um, so I, I, I just don't have more on, on that. I'd be happy to take that question, though, and get back to you. Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one more from the phone, and then I'll come back into the room. Um, Idris Reuters. Hello? We can hear you. Uh, uh, hi, I'm sorry, this is still Jeff Shogel. Uh, the T-72 is a fairly old design. Can OSD say why it's not providing newer tanks like the Abrams, the Leopard, or even Korean tanks? 
Jeff, as you're right, these are um, Soviet-era tanks. Um, these are tanks that the Ukrainians know how to use on the battlefield. Um, and again, this is we are providing these in coordination with uh, the Netherlands and the Czech Republic. Um, in terms of why aren't we providing new tanks um, or American tanks, uh, introducing a new main battle tank is um, extremely costly, it's time sensitive, um, and it would be a huge undertaking for the Ukrainian forces. Um, so we do continue to consult with our allies and partners to assess um, our ability on what we can provide in terms of Western armor platforms, but these tanks, um, we believe, will make a, a difference on the battlefield. Um, let me just, since Idriston was not there, I'm just going to take Heather's question, and then I'll come back in the room. So Heather, US and I. Much. Um, two quick questions. Um, I was hoping you could tell us if you've gotten any information about the attack on Sevastopol. Um, now I know that we still haven't gotten a damage assessment, and then I was wondering if you can give us any um, further information on the riverine boat you mentioned. And I think Idris was trying to uh, speak in as well. Back to Idris after after you. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Sevastopol, I, I don't have any more information there for you. Um, you know, we've seen the open source reporting, but I, I don't have more um, to add to that. Um, in terms of the 40 riverine boats that we are providing Ukraine, this is, again, not the first time that we've provided um, these armored boats uh, to Ukraine, but how and when the Ukrainians use them is, um, is, the, is up to them and their decision. Um, so with that, I'm just going to go to Idris, and then I promise I'm coming back in the room. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Idris, are you there? Sorry, we'll we'll you'll find me, I'm sure, and, and we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll talk. Um, yes, right over here. Yeah. Sure. South Korea. So yesterday, Secretary Austin and South Korean Minister Lee reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to deploy U.S. strategic assets to the Korean Peninsula. Yep. And during the press conference, Secretary said that the U.S. don't have plan to change permanent positioning or stationing of strategic assets. So my question is how U.S. will increase the frequency and the intensity of deployment of strategic assets to the Peninsula? Well, I mean, I don't have anything to announce today on any new deployment of strategic assets, but I think Vigilant Storm, the exercise that's ongoing now, speaks for itself. Um, and an opportunity presented itself to extend that exercise for a day, um, which allowed some additional flying operations with our ROC counterpart. Um, and, you know, these, these exercises increase confidence in our joint operations. Um, and, and again, you know, this is not the last exercise. We will continue to do exercises with um, South Korea or Japan when, when opportunities present itself. But um, I don't have an announcement to make of any redeployment of any assets. Great. Yes. Thank you. Oh, and I'll come back to you, Idris, since you couldn't get on the phone. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yesterday, Secretary Austin and his South Korean counterpart um, said if North Korea um, uses a nuclear weapon in a, any threatening way, it would be the end of the regime. Um, can you just speak to that a little bit and define what exactly North Korea would have to do for the U.S. and South Korea to end the regime? So I'm not going to speculate on hypo hypotheticals or uh get ahead of any decisions. I think those comments stand for themselves. Um, we've been crystal clear that um, any threat to uh, our partners and allies in the region or U.S. personnel, we would certainly um, respond. But um, I'm not going to get into hypothetical situations on what that response would look like or, or what type of response it would warrant. Would it involve testing a tactical nuclear weapon? Again, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals, but uh, thank you for your question. Idris, and then I'm coming back to the front. Just a clarification on the Hawk Air Defense missiles. Sure. So is it funding to refurbish them for a future presidential drawdown? I, I was just confused about that. That's right. So this will be funding from through the USAI package um, that because these missiles need to go into contract for refurbishment, then they would get announced in the PDA because it would be coming off of our shelves. But the contract to refurbish these missiles, would, it would have to go out for, for them. I'm not going to get into how many we're supplying, just for OPSEC reasons, but um, uh, don't have an exact timeline yet. Um, I, th I, I mean, I think 
uh, you know, I, yeah, I don't have an exact timeline on that. I'm sorry. And just on the joint statement yesterday with the South Koreans, um, there was a line saying the two countries pledged to do more uh, to advance the alliance commitment and mm -hmm. just generally the alliance. What does that look like in terms of doing more? What more can you do? Well, I, you know, I think the secretary and minister Lee spoke to this when they were here at the podiums. Um, you know, part of that is continuing our joint exercises, our deepening our bilateral relationship, and also trilateral cooperation within the region. But part of that is having the, the dialogue that we did just yesterday. Part of that is having this open communication between our two countries um, to talk through the, the threats that we see both in the Indo-Pacific and also the acute threat of, of Russia, but, you know, also to um, discuss more areas where we can work together as, as two countries. Great. Yes. Just a few more follow-ups on the tanks. Sure. So is this the first um, provision of tanks by to Ukraine by any um, by any country or? I I would have to check on that. I I don't know if other um, allies um, have provided these tanks before, but I know from the United States perspective, this is the first time that we are we are paying for these tanks to to be used in Ukraine. Then the second question. So there, uh, I have the impression. So there's. It seemed that some countries were sort of waiting for you know, uh, the other to go first in terms of the provision of tanks, um, I guess, in, especially in terms of Germany. Um, is this something that could potentially shake loose some, some further provision of, of, of tanks to Ukraine? Well, it's, it's, um, it's hard to speculate on what this could uh, potentially, uh, as in, in your words, shake loose or um, what other countries will commit to. But I think it's important to note that this agreement came out of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. We're seeing continued progress um, with over, you know, 50 countries meeting at the last meeting um, to talk through what does short-term and long-term support look like for Ukraine. So um, I think the Ukraine Contact Group has been um, incredibly successful in um, uniting our partners and allies uh, in supporting Ukraine um, and also making sure that they get the warfare capabilities that they need on the battlefield. Yeah, I'll take a, yeah, Lara, and then I'll come to you. Just, just two follow-ups. First, of, sure. of the, the Hawk missiles, is this mm -hmm. the first time the U.S. is paying for them to be refurbished? Yes. And would you say the, U the ally that's sending them? Uh, that This is all the information that I'm going to get into, but in terms of... It's a well, ally. Well, these are these are our air missiles that will oh. be refurbished. Oh, they're ours. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, the I think you're getting the tanks confused with the the Hawks. So the Hawk the sorry the tanks the T72s are from the Czech industrial base. Yeah. These are our Hawk air missiles that have to be refurbished. As you know, we don't use the Hawk systems anymore. Okay, so we're yeah. paying for their refurbishment, mm -hmm. and then we'll send them to Ukraine. That's right. Okay. And then the, um, the 250M117 armored vehicles, is sure. that the first time we're sending armored vehicles? Um, I'd have to check. No, we've sent armored vehicles. I, well, let me check. I'm going to take that question because I, I don't want to misspeak on that. But um, yeah, and I just want to make sure that it's clear that these, um, the, this is the first time that we're sending these particular armored vehicles. Um, I just want to make sure that um, it's clear that these are going to be um, are going to be intended to be used through the excess defense articles, which is a program that services can use to declare equipment in excess um, and make available for allies and partners. So this often includes older equipment, um, equipment that's in need of you know service and repairs um, or upgrades, um, and they just no longer meet the services requirements. And so that's why we are. Being able to those, we're sending those through USAI, not PDA. They have to be refurbished first, so they have to go out for a contract for refurbishing. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Great. Um, yesterday, President uh, Biden, during his campaign uh, rally in San Diego, mm -hmm. um, he said, we are going to free Iran. So does that mean uh, there are any plans, especially here in the, the DOD, uh, maybe to assist the protests there? or any steps that may be lead to change the regime in Iran? So I would refer you to the White House to speak more to the president's comments. Um, you know, again, we have been 
clear from this podium, and I think um, other my, my other counterparts have been clear that um, we're seeing peaceful protests take place, um, and this is the Iranian regime's attempt to suppress, uh, to violently suppress them, um, and we just urge that you know, we they allow these peaceful protests to, to continue. I'll um, take, yeah, uh -huh. sorry, uh, sorry. Question, no, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. uh, About uh, Ukraine. Um, yeah. Recently, the attacks on power and water uh, sources mm -hmm. across Ukraine, uh, especially around the capital, has been increasing too much. Uh, what more can be done to stop those attacks? Well, I mean, the, the attacks that Russia is launching, I mean, certainly the Tomorrow, today, Vladimir Putin has the choice to end this war. Um, those 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 strikes could certainly start by his decision. Um, in terms of how to stop those attacks, I mean, we are, as you're seeing from this package, we are giving more aerial defense systems to the Ukrainians to do just that. Um, the the Hawk uh, missiles that we're giving, um, the Hawk is a mid-range uh, surface-to-air or guided missile that um, has a longer uh, range than the Stingers that we provided earlier this year, so that will be able to help um, the Ukrainians further on, on the battlefield. Um, but look, you know, the Ukrainians are doing what they can to to um, push back against these um, brutal attacks. And um, I think we're seeing their, them being successful. We're seeing their counteroffensive continue um, to go on. We're seeing, uh, you know, Russian Russian forces, you know, shoring up their defensive lines. But we are seeing the Ukrainians make success, not only shooting down some of these drones, but just on the battlefield itself. Great. Yeah, I'll take a few more, and then I will have to wrap up, because there's another event in here soon. Yes, go Thank ahead. You Thank you for taking my question. Yeah. I have a uh, question about the uh, North Korea. Sure. Uh, uh, how much do you concern about the possibility of the North Korea conducting nuclear tests in the near future? And does Pentagon see any indication of the nuclear tests? <coughs> so we remain concerned. Um, uh, about a prospects of any nuclear test. Uh, we know that the North Koreans have made preparations for such a test, um, and this assessment, you know, remains consistent with what we have said from the beginning, but we certainly r remain concerned, um, and which is why, and you heard the secretary and his rock counterpart speak to this yesterday, um, we're in very close touch with our allies and partners in the region, um, and should there be uh, such a test, you know, we would be able to respond quickly if needed. Great. I'm going to make just a few more and then, yeah, go ahead. Just uh, regarding the continuing resolution, and obviously the department has a lot of modernization programs and priorities, as Barbara alluded to, in terms of closing the gap with China. Yeah. Where right now are the biggest areas of concern of what's being held back uh, by the continuing resolution, which you know, given the elections next week, potential change in Congress could be going into next spring. Well, as you know, I wouldn't really be able to speak to so much of, of, of um, what is happening in Congress and, and um, you know, potentials of, of the package. As you know, we put forward a budget. We urge Congress to pass that budget. Um, the continuing resolution, of course, limits some of the things that we are able to do. So, you know, we would urge Congress to, to really look and, and see if they— um, you know, can pass the budget that the secretary put forward. Yeah. And just in terms mm -hmm. of the current situation, are there any particular programs that are, are most affected or where you're having to scramble the most to try to deal with the, the current resolution? I wouldn't get into, um, I'm not going to speak to any particular programs that, that are impacted. I mean, as you're seeing, our uh, aid to Ukraine continues, um, our support and our exercises continue, so we are still being able to operate. But again, um, while the continuing resolution does limit some of the things that we are able to do, um, it is important that Congress, you know, pass a budget so we can expand on those. Okay. Um, I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming in today. Happy Friday, and I hope you have a good weekend.